You got your Bible with you? Yes. We haven't done this in a while. Hold your Bible up. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. The Word of God. The Word of God. I believe I am. I believe Everything I am. it says I am. Everything it says I will be. I will be. Everything it says I can be. This morning, I will be taught from God's Word. It will go into my heart. Renew my mind. Change my life. So I boldly declare that as I leave this place today, I will not be the same. No, never, never, never. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. I'm just going to have to tell you right now, this is not probably one of those messages where you're going to jump up and down and go, hey, man, that is so good. I'm so glad I heard that this morning. But it's just before we start to say, I love you, Pastor. Pastor. Okay. But it is good and it will build you up. And um, if you're not guilty of this, then everything's cool. Everything's good. It's all right. You can just give the CD to somebody else. Amen. If you're taking notes, uh, I've entitled this Living Under the Correct Covenant. And uh, you can go ahead and uh, make a place in your Bible, mark it at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and then uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and 2 Timothy 2. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for instruction by the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Father, as uh, we hear your word this morning and instruction, it will go into our hearts, and as we have declared, it will renew our minds, change our lives. And so, Father, we give you thanksgiving and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a lot of people trying to get God to move on their behalf, and, uh, but, but they've never learned about the new covenant or uh, even know much about it at all. Uh, but they have tried to get it to work for them under the old rule. See, one of the big problems in the body of Christ is that, unfortunately, most mainline churches teach out of the new covenant but expect you to live by the law, the old covenant rules. And we've talked about this recently. And so it's like mixing oil and water. It doesn't work. Uh, And so they continue... uh, uh, to live miserable, defeated lives uh, for years. Uh, to give you just kind of a little idea of the mix of the ruse, I, I remember uh, years ago uh, <clears throat> um, when Somerville High School was pretty much the high school in this area, and it was the, always that you knew they were going to be state champions. And so we went to, the kids were still in school, and we went to, Almost all the games, and so uh, Pastor Ann went with us one night, and we were sitting in our regular section, and, and uh, Somerville got down to the uh, 20-yard line, <clears throat> and uh, they were resisted and resisted, and they got down to a uh, fourth down and five yards, and uh, they switched a reverse, a double reverse, and uh, went in and made a touchdown, and and it it was one of those move, it was one of those moves where you want to yell, but it was so strategically cool that for a moment there everybody just kind of went oh, like that, like I can't believe they really did this and it worked. And during that moment of silence, which lasted about a second, Anne jumped up and she says, "Home run!" And everybody in the stadium. 9,000 people heard teacher and more yell, home run. Now we laugh, but see, she didn't know the rules of the game. And that's okay. You were cheering them and 
and everybody cheered you after, or laughed at you or something anyway. Anyway, I just thought that was so cute. Uh, <clears throat> so a lot of Christians <laughs> are saying home run when they should be saying touchdown, and they wonder why they don't understand what's going on. Some, even, some, some people even say, well, well, God's bringing all that back, that old covenant, that, the, the law, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and my question is what? And, and where, where, where does it say that in the Bible? In fact, Paul <clears throat> dedicated an entire book, uh, an entire letter to the Galatians telling them because they were trying to go back under the law, because they were living, they were attempting to live the new covenant, uh, worshiping Jesus, but yet they were still under the old rules, and it wasn't working, and so they said, well, because faith isn't working, we're going to go back under the law, we shouldn't have even messed with this faith stuff, and so Paul spent the entire book of Galatians teaching them and admonishing them and showing them you don't go back. That covenant's been fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled it. We're not to have to participate in any of the ceremonies of it, any, anything having to do with it. It's been fulfilled. It had its purpose. It's been fulfilled. Now you have a new covenant, a better covenant, uh, he said, and it's got new rules. And so he was trying to teach them that, but the church still has trouble uh, <clears throat> going into the new covenant and not bringing the old rules in there. Uh, that's why some can't get healed. Uh, and that's why some stay in poverty. Uh, because, you know, uh, part of the body of Christ has come up with poverty vows. And that's not, that's not even under the old covenant. I don't know where that came from. Um, and, and concerning the healing, there's some churches that teach well, you know, J Jesus healed, but he doesn't heal anymore. And then you have to do certain things for healing to be in your body, which is under that old law. And uh, so they have trouble receiving healing because they, they are, are trying to operate under the wrong covenant. And that's why some people come to the altar every week uh, trying to get forgiveness for the same sins. Um, over and over and over again, just wanting to make sure that uh, that they're forgiven, just to make sure I'm going to do. I'm going to go down there again, and they stay under that bondage and that condemnation and that that guilt uh, all week long. Anyway, uh, they're attempting to live the Christian life still under that old covenant, but the old covenant is gone. Can you say with me? It's gone. It's gone. <clears throat> and there are people who have no idea who they are now that they are a Christian. Because they don't know what their covenant says. Uh, we now are to live under a whole new set of standards and values and posture and mindset. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. In fact, I'll read it to you uh, in, in the... Uh, let me go here and find it. In the Amplified Bible, it says uh, in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs. And he was talking about, actually, the ones that were living under the law. But he said, Be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable, and perfect in his sight for you. So you have to develop a new mindset. And uh, people still carry around a lot of that old baggage. Uh, they got saved, but they don't know that they've been forgiven. They don't know that that thing that had been attached to them before that has now set them free. And so they drag that around uh, and they stay in bondage, they stay in guilt, they stay in condemnation, and the devil loves it because he's full of that, and he, he wants to keep you from being productive as a believer. And uh, 
then there are those that think that uh, money will fix their money problems. And there are some people that they, they tithe or they give offerings uh, kind of a, to, to kind of get God to do something for them to get them out of their financial problems. And you should tithe and you should bring offerings, but that obligation and the curse of that, if you didn't, was under the law. That's gone. You're not cursed if you don't tithe. You're not, you don't have a curse if you don't give offerings. Uh, you limit yourself with God being able to bless you with a blessing, and I'm not here to teach about tithes and offerings, but people get under bondage about that. And they say, well, if I, if I just give a lot of money, then my money problems will be taken care of. Well, see, the thing about it is money can't cure money problems because money problems are not caused by having a lot of money. Money problems are caused by all that other stuff that you're involved in. Wrong spending, too much spending, spending what you don't have, maxing out credit cards and the, the list goes on and on and on. There's where your money problems come from. Not, uh, and, and money won't correct that because if you, if you get, uh, <clears throat> you might be standing there saying, well, you know, you give me $25,000, I'll show you it'll take care of it right now. No, what got you into that, if you don't change the way you're doing, you'll get right back there again, right in the middle of it, <laughs> right where you were and probably worse. Uh, see, <clears throat> And one of the reasons why I wanted the, the young people to stay in here this morning, and, and it has to do not only with young people, some, some are up in years and, and they still think this way. See, when you become 18, 19, 20, uh, you're an adult. Boy, it got quiet in this Presbyterian church. Now, you're an adult. Can you say adult? adult. And when you get to that age, you're going to have to do the things that are necessary for you to become successful as an adult. Amen. Words like responsibility. Uh, no longer can you point your finger at your parents. Well, they're the reason why I'm not successful. They're, they're the reason this. Sir. It was called, and <clears throat> okay, maybe you had some bad parents. But you're 18, 19, 20. It's over with. You can't live that out. All right. If they didn't raise you right, then find out what's right and move on. Don't play the blame game. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've, I've heard all kinds of testimonies from, from uh, young people. I think what you call them now, millennials. Like that's a bad word. It's not a bad word. It's the future of our country, folks. <laughs> and we need them to learn and we need them to become responsible. Uh, they're, they're our youth. They're our, they are our tender harvest. Amen. And we need to begin to think of them that way. But you can't, you can't put the blame on your parents anymore that I'm not successful because my parents didn't teach me. Well, uh, you need to find out what they didn't teach you. And uh, when, when you become a parent and you have children, you're going to find out that your parents weren't all that bad. But you've got to learn to carry the torch for yourself. And, uh, and, and see, to blame your parents or other people won't heal your brokenness and won't give you value. Uh, a lot of young people say, well, I'm just not worth anything because I, I can't do this or I, I, I'm, I'm just... Uh, I, I don't think I can ever get ahead because I can't seem to do this or can't seem to do that. Yes, you can. And if you understand your covenant, whether you're a millennial or whether you're 99 years old, 99 or 100 years old, then things will change. The only way that you'll be able to get healed of whatever you're dealing with is to have a personal relationship with God yourself. Not your parents' God, your God. Amen. Um, in fact, I call it, I, I've, had, I've had young people come to me, and I, I've had <laughs> full-grown adults come to me and say, well, um, <clears throat> I'm turning over a new page. I said, you are. Yes, I'm 
I'm going to be doing this and I'm going to be doing better and, and I'm getting out of this and I'm going to quit doing drugs. I'm going to, I'm going to quit uh, being involved in this and being involved in that. I said, you are. Yes, I am. And I said, what do you base that on? Well, I've just decided I've made a quality decision. They've heard me say that before. I've made a quality decision that I'm going to do things better. I said, yeah, you really have? How? Based on what? Well, I'm just going to do that. No, you're not. Unless you have had, and this is a word some young people will say, here he says it again. If you, unless you've had what I call an epiphany. Do you know what an epiphany is? An epiphany, did any of you watch the movie Crook? <laughs> Never mind. He had an epiphany. He had the wrong kind of epiphany. An epiphany is to realize that what you're doing is not working, and the only way it will work is for you to establish a personal relationship, an intimate relationship with Jesus, who will work it out for you and show you how to make it better, how to get out of what you're in, how to do things that you don't know how to do. You've got to have a, uh, a revelation, uh, a rhema, uh, an eye opener. You've got to see the light. Epiphany. Not just because you decided to do it. People do that every year. They write down New Year's resolutions. I I'm going to diet January the 1st. And somebody brings four chocolate cakes by my house. Well, I can't be ugly. I have to eat them. Unless I have had an epiphany and I've said, I'm losing the weight. I'm, you know. But you can't do it on your own. Only with God's help can you get out of any place that you don't want to be. And people have to realize that. The only thing that works is a personal relationship with Jesus. And the only way that will happen is through this new covenant. Say with me, new covenant. New covenant. Say new testament. New testament. Say gospels and, the letters. gospels and the letters. That's the only way it's going to happen. Because you have to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. And I tell people when they become new Christians... Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John three times through in 30 days. Commit to do that, and you'll know Jesus. You'll know him. You read the, all those books through three times in 30 days, and you'll know him. But you've got to develop that relationship. Just getting saved isn't going to get you out of your mess. Well, it'll get you out of hell. And that's a, that's a real good thing. And it'll make you, it put you on your way to heaven. But we still live here. And the new covenant tells us how to live here and live here in abundance. Amen. So, uh, you can't ride on someone else's faith or their relationship with the Lord. You can do that for a while. But it's only for a while. You've got to develop your own relationship with Jesus. And only you can do that or your problems will continue. Nobody can do it for you. Um, what we need, I think, is a millennial outpouring of Holy Ghost power. That's what we need. And I believe we're on the eve of it. In fact, I think we're in it already because a lot of young people are really getting turned on to Jesus. And uh, Adults to age 99 plus <laughs> need to stop playing the blame game and grow up in Jesus so that they can live the good life. It's the only way it's going to happen. So why do we need to make sure that we're living under the right covenant? That's the question. Because only a personal relationship with Jesus will solve your situations. That's it. And you find out how to do that in this book. Uh, only Jesus can do what your psychologist can't do. Your psychologist can charge you a lot of money and give you books that clearly define your problem. 
like you didn't know what it was. And then they'll put band-aids on it. But you finish with it. And if you'll be honest with yourself, there's still something lacking. There's something not there. And only Jesus can do for you what your psychiatrist can't do. Do you know that one of the highest rates of suicide in this country is psychiatrists? And you're going to them for help? I have suicidal tendencies. I need to go to my psychiatrist. I wouldn't recommend it. Unless they're not reading their own stuff. But see, they're not Jesus. And I know this sounds crazy to the body of Christ, but I've run into this with some Christians. Uh, only Jesus can do what your guru can't do. Oh yeah, I, 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 I know some Christians that are, mm, they're arming. They're going to the beach and sitting there, watch the sun come up, worshiping the sun. And, um, I don't know who they're talking to. But that won't work either. If I just isolate myself and get into that perfect moment of tranquility. Unless you're meditating on the word of God, you're not going to be in any kind of tranquility that will last. Just fooling yourself. And only Jesus can do for you what your doctor can't do. <clears throat> I've always had trouble and I don't have a problem with doctors and surgeons and stuff like that, you know, that they're good. But I always had practice with the term, uh, problems with the term practicing medicine. I don't like to be practiced on. Well, you know, this is going on. Let's try this medication. Let's not. And only Jesus can do for you what your medicine can't do. Medicine is kind of a stabilizer, but it's not a healer. Do you know what medicine is? And I'm not saying don't take your medicine. Do you know that it's controlled poison? You can take the recommended dosage, and it will help counteract some things in your body. But do you know if you took the whole bottle at one time, you would die? And only Jesus can do for you what your coffee drinking neighbors that know everything. I'm going to go next door and talk to my neighbor. They will counsel me and tell me what to do. If it's not, if it's not with this Bible open in front of you on the table, they won't. They always have a better idea. And most of them will tell you why you can't do something. You ever notice that? They'll tell you why you can't, why healing really doesn't work anymore, or why this doesn't work, or what you're doing doesn't work, and uh, I don't see where that helps anybody. So why is it that only Jesus can do that? Because Jesus will go to the very root of the situation. He goes to the root of it, uh, root of the matter, and, and, and he, he works in you and, and changes you and makes you free. Uh, in fact, if you would, uh, just briefly look over at 1 Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> we just read that recently. 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, when you begin to depend on Jesus, uh, jumping in at uh, verse 6, and I'm going to read this in the Amplified Translation. Therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation. Uh, what he's saying there is uh, quit trying to work it out yourself. I can tell I got this. I don't know how many people have told me when I wanted to pray for Oh, no, Pastor, I got this. I got this. It's no big deal. I got this. And then later, when it got worse, now I'm supposed to pull them really out of the mud when we could have taken care of it earlier. So he says, uh, humble yourself in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. See, if you yield to the Lord, he will exalt you. He promised he would. It's right here in his word. Casting all or the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind, be vigilant and cautious at all times for that enemy of yours, the devil. Who is your enemy? The devil. The devil. 
roams around like a lion. He's not a lion. He roars like a lion in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Withstand him. How? Be firm in the faith. Just be firm in faith, what the word says about it. Against his onset, rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined, knowing that the same identical sufferings, we talked about that last week, our suffering is to maintain what Jesus obtained on the cross. Not suffering sickness, not suffering disease, not suffering poverty, not just suffering for the Lord, you know, with, with lack and, and poverty. That's not what it is. Our suffering is to maintain what Jesus obtained on the cross, to stand for it. And he said, knowing that the identical sufferings are pointed to your brotherhood, the whole body of Christian throughout the world. In other words, everybody's having to deal with the same things. So just withstand him, maintaining what Jesus obtained on the cross, just like everybody else is having to deal with. And after you have suffered or maintained, stood on what the word says in the middle of your situation, regardless of what it looks like, sounds like, or what people are saying. Once you have suffered a little while, can you say that with me? A little while. Say it again. A little while. Look at me. A little while. Just enough to set the alarm off. Jesus said, ah, ah, ah. I see what they're going through, but look at there, they're standing on my word. And all that happens in just a little while. And he said, after just a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, well, Jesus said himself in Luke chapter 4, that's him who has called you to his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself, do you see that? Will himself complete and make you what you ought to be, establish and ground you securely and strengthen and settle you. Amen. Just trust him and he'll do all that for you. He'll do it himself. You might say, well, I hear what you say, pastor, but... Well, like Elder Sand says, get your butt out of the way. <laughs> it's not, I hear what you say, Pastor, but. Uh, no, you need to uh, put that aside and get a solid relationship with Jesus. And what he'll do for you will amaze you. It will amaze you. Some people don't want to be healed or set free. And I find that hard to believe. I, I've prayed for people and, and uh, uh, you know, I'm not putting down our country or the, our, our society, capitalism, works, uh, benefits work, but also benefits and welfare where it, where, it, where it exists is also misused and it becomes the source for a lot of people. And I've talked with people that have had, uh, like in, in, in the military, and they've had disabilities, and they've gotten themselves hurt. And so they, they get full disability. And um, I prayed with some of them, and I said, well, let's, let's, let's pray for this situation, get you. I, no, I'll lose my benefits. You'll lose your benefits, so you don't want to be healed of that because you'll lose your benefits, saying that those benefits are better than his benefits. See, what that says is you're not trusting God to supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What happens if that account runs dry in the government? You'll be first in the healing line, won't you? But if you don't understand your covenant, when you, when you have that attitude, you don't understand your covenant. You don't. So then you can get in the healing line. You still won't be able to receive anything because you don't believe what it says because you don't know what it says. Wonderful preaching, Pastor Mike. That's just wonderful. I love it. I'm so glad I came this morning. 
Uh, is it time to go yet? Well, it almost is, but I don't have much further to go. Jesus said the truth will make you free. He also said in Mark chapter 4, the truth will offend you if you don't receive it. So we're not going to have any offended people in here. Amen. Um, see, I'm not going to fight you for your healing. I'm not going to fight you for it. Uh, what you hold on to is what you have to rely on. I'm going to say that again. What you hold on to and depend on is what you have to rely on. And outside this covenant, everything else is subject to fail. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you when I pray for some people, uh, they've come down and, and uh, they resist. They See, they don't understand the statutes of the covenant. And uh, uh, I can pray for them, lay my hands on them. Uh, and... I, I can I can sense it when I've prayed for people, not just here, but different places I've been to. I've prayed and laid hands on a lot, a lot, a lot of people. And I can see that foot when I come to I can see that foot go back. I am not going out in the spirit. If God Himself physically came down here and laid hands, I am not. I do I do, I'm not doing that. Why do you, why are you so adamant about that? Because that's the way I was when I first came into the in the, in the word of faith, just right at first, I said, you know, that pastor's pushing those people down. And I remember the first night I went to a, a, a teaching where they had um, healing, prayer for healing. I was in a suit. Man, I was just eaten up with sinus infection. I felt horrible. Somebody taught me to go there anyway. and I wanted to be prayed for, but I was still a good Methodist. Methodists don't fall on the floor. What? We sit there quietly. And we say amen when everybody else says amen. So I was there in my three-piece suit right from work. And the pastor was coming and he was laying hands on people. And they were falling down, falling out. <laughs> and he got to me. And I didn't even know this because I was still a young Christian. I had that foot back there. Because he wasn't going to push me down. I was strong. He wasn't going to push me down. So he just comes by me, and he just goes, whoosh, be healed. Didn't touch me. The next thing I knew, I was looking at acoustical tile. And I thought, oh, man, is this embarrassing? And I breathed, and I thought, I can breathe. I'm not coughing. I'm not blowing my nose. Well, my goodness, I got healed. See, if you give him just a little bit of room, and I understand, I understood that God healed. I just was ignorant of the other part of it. I'm not anymore. And it's only as you spend time with the Lord and find out the benefits of these things that happen in the realm of the Spirit that you can receive. Amen. It's okay. It's scriptural. Amen. But you've got to decide if you're going to go all the way and have a personal relationship with Jesus for yourself. That includes salvation, Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, the glory, all of it. Just go in full bore, not holding back anything. The whole package. But nobody can make that decision but you. And all this can happen if you understand covenant relationship with Jesus. Allow him to do the work in you that you've never been able to do for yourself. And you know what that is because you can't do it yourself. Amen. Hold your Bible up. Let's hold it up a minute. Do you believe what's in it? Okay, you can put them down. Do you believe what's in it or do you believe what you believe and you try to change what the Bible says? Like one good, wonderful denomination that I actually got saved under, uh, they're very down on tongues. 
and they'll give you all the reasons why it's passed away. And the scriptures that they use aren't even really the scriptures that are having to do anything with that. They'll use scriptures like, do all speak in tongues? They say, see? And they're the ones that don't. And he's not even talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. He's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And it says the Spirit wills, and tongues is one of the gifts of the Spirit. And all might not speak in tongues at that session, at that meeting. And then another time they might. It's as the Spirit wills. But the gift of tongues and speaking with other tongues that comes from the baptism of the Holy Spirit are two different concepts. They're not even the same. But they'll take these things because they don't understand their covenant. So they're missing out. What you don't understand in the covenant, you'll miss out on. And you're not going to get it all just coming here. You have to go home. You have to sit down. You have to read your covenant. You have to spend some intimate time with the Holy Spirit. And you have to do this on a daily basis. And then at some point, it will hit you. I can trust the covenant. I can trust the covenant. Amen. Uh, look with me at Ephesians chapter 2. I think I told you to turn there and hold the place. <clears throat> Verse 11. Therefore remember that at one time you were Gentiles, heathens, in the flesh, called uncircumcision by those who call themselves circumcision, itself a mere mark in the flesh made by human hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. There are two things when you're a stranger to the covenant that happen. Number one, you have no hope. If you don't know that healing is in the covenant, you have no hope of healing. It's hopeless. And the word hope there simply means anticipation of deliverance or a better life. And the second thing, when you're a stranger to the covenant, it says you're without God in this world. Wow. Can you imagine going out of here and everything that we're dealing with and be without God? See, because God only works with man through covenant. Did you know that? Some people say, well, I don't know why God won't do this and won't do that. Have you gone to the covenant? Have you called upon the covenant? That's the only way he'll work with you is through the covenant. He gave it to us. And as Christians, you can't just act religious and ask God to do this or that. He hates religion. In fact, if you look at the, the, the root definition of religion in the original language, it's return again to bondage. That's what it means. <clears throat> so you can't just act religious and ask God to do things outside of the covenant if you don't know your covenant. That's why many Christians are living defeated lives. They don't know their covenant. And you can only go to God through the covenant. They don't read and operate under their covenant because they don't know what it is. Uh, and the result, uh, you don't know God. You don't know what he will, can, or has already done for you. You've got to find these things out. See, the church body the body of Christ has got to stop playing church and get into the covenant. That's why God gave us the name of this church, Covenant Life Church of Somerville. Covenant life. Covenant and life go together. They're inseparable. Amen. And if you're operating under the wrong agreement or the wrong covenant, it's going to be wrong in your life. If you start to, if you continue to try to operate under the law, then you're going to be subject to the law. And there's no grace under the law. I don't know about you, but I need grace. A lot of it. 
Because, see, this, this covenant that we've been given through the shed blood of Jesus is an absolute covenant. And covenant is, it's irrevocable vows. They can't be changed. When, when two parties uh, are promising certain things, and there's two major covenants, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go into all that, but there's, there's a lot of covenants throughout the Bible, but there's two major covenants. The old covenant called the law, or the covenant of law, and the covenant of grace, or the new covenant. And we're under the covenant of grace. And every covenant has a benefactor. In our case, it's God. Every covenant has a beneficiary. That's you. Every covenant has benefits. And under our covenant, it's the blessing. Amen? So, uh, turn quickly, almost finished, to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, I think it is. Uh, we'll look at verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from a childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ. Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's your covenant. Uh, and when you try to operate and get things that's promised in the new covenant under that old covenant attitude of condemnation and guilt and shame, uh, then you'll have trouble receiving healing. You'll have trouble getting your prayers answered. You'll have trouble... Uh, living well because you're not operating under the provisions of the covenant and God can only touch you and come to you and help you and work for you under this new covenant. A, 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 a unbelievable price was paid to make this available. The blood of Jesus. Amen. Um, <clears throat> see, to try to live under the law or that old covenant, and receive new covenant benefits is kind of like, well, if you, if you go to court, because outside of covenant, there are also contracts. Now, contracts can be added to and subtracted from by mutual agreement from different people. So that's different than a covenant, because once a covenant is set, it's there forever. And But, but contracts actually have an expiration date on it. Covenant doesn't. The only way you can get out of covenant is through death. Can you imagine going to a courtroom and you're defending a certain uh, part of your contract you have with someone and you, you picked a contract up off the table and you went to court and you're presenting that contract and it's the wrong one. What are they going to do in court? They're going to throw it out. It's the wrong contract has nothing to do with anything that you're there for today. Or you bring a contract that's been expired. Well, you don't have any rights under that contract. It's expired. Have you ever gone somewhere and tried to buy something and you use an expired credit card? Do they still give you the stuff? No. No. Because there are rules and regulations under that credit card, and one of them is, if you've gone over your limit, you don't get anything. Amen? Are you trying to get cash out of an ATM, but there's no money in there? Are you having an expired debit card, or whatever it is? Go ahead and close a bank account, and then go tomorrow and try to use that debit card. You don't get anything, do you? And so see, that's, those are practical things, but <clears throat> it works the same way. And I've even had Christians come to me 
that showed me that they didn't understand the covenant they had with God. Uh, they said, well, Pastor, I can't expect him to heal me. I can't expect him to bless me. I, I, I can't expect him to deliver me. And I said, why? Because I've broken the covenant. No, you didn't. Oh, I did. I broke the covenant. What, what do you mean? Well, I sinned. Now, I'm not condoning sin and I'm not giving you a license to sin because I found Christians will do it without one. But your sinning has nothing to do with invalidating the covenant. What? Yeah, you know why? You can't break a covenant you didn't make. That covenant is between God and Jesus. You were brought into it by believing it. And you have all the rights and provisions under that covenant because you accepted Jesus. You accepted that blood sacrifice which consummated that covenant. It's a forever covenant. You can't break it. It'll never be annulled. It'll never expire. Every provision that's under it will be available for you forever and ever and ever. That is your inheritance. That is the blessing. So when you mess up, go before the Lord and say, I messed up, but I thank you Jesus died that I might be forgiven. So I thank you, Lord, that I'm forgiven and I turn away from what I'm doing or saying and I turn back to you, Lord. Amen. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, knowing that Jesus said in Matthew 6, that everything now that I have need of will be added to me. Amen. It'll be added to me. I don't have to shed any blood. I don't have to make a new agreement. That covenant is sealed forever. And we've been given the Holy Spirit to confirm it in our lives. Amen. And so it's very important that you find out what your covenant is, what the provisions are. And I think if you're having trouble receiving from God, you'll find that, well, there's a provision. I didn't know that was in there. Well, do you believe it? Yeah, it's in the Bible. I believe that then you grab hold of that provision and you'll notice that area of your life will open up into blessing. God's just waiting for you to believe it. He sent the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. Hidden mysteries. We've been talking about that uh, in, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that we've been talking about that. There's mysteries, but it's now been revealed to you. Everything that God knows. Now this is going to shake your religious thinking. Everything that God knows, you can know. Will we know everything that God knows? No, <laughs> we won't. But we can. He's made it available for us. It's open. Everything that he knows, you can know. Because Jesus has been made unto you wisdom. He will reveal to you anything you want to know. Well, nobody can know what God knows. Well, that's a lie, because yes, you can. The Bible says you can know exactly what God knows. You don't know what God will do in this situation. Yes, you can know exactly what God will do in that situation, because there's a promise and provision now through the cross for every situation you face in life. There's a provision that will get you through it. Amen. Why would anybody not want to be a Christian? Because you don't know. I got saved when I was 25, and when I found out what was available to me, I got mad. I did. I got, I got mad. Why didn't somebody tell me this earlier? Why? I've been going to church on and off all my life ever since I was little. Why didn't somebody tell me this? Huh? You're right. They didn't know. They didn't know either. Thank God that he placed me under some men that knew and were not ashamed to say it. Amen. Amen. Stand with me and say, I have a covenant with God. <laughs> and it supplies every need that I have. It, supplies every need that it I have. gives me all the power I need. <clears throat> it has given me authority over the enemy. I can in no way fail as I cast my care upon Jesus. And I yield my life to him. And I get intense. 
with finding out what my covenant is. I thank you for it, Lord. I praise you for it. I give you all the glory. Amen. Can you give the Lord a shout this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, every head bowed just a moment. If you're in here this morning and you heard this message and you haven't made a decision to receive Jesus, or maybe you're just not sure. I, I, I think I did, but I'm not sure. Someone asked you a question. If you die today, would you go to heaven? If your answer is, well, I hope so, then you need some, you need some no-so salvation. And so I'm here to offer you no-so salvation where you can know that when your life is required of you, heaven is your home. And that everything you have need of has already been made available to you through this covenant that we have, the Bible, that New Testament, that new covenant. Amen. So if you're not sure and you want to make sure, just lift your hand up. We'll all pray together. Nobody will be embarrassed. Everybody in here knows this. You know that you say, you know you're going to heaven. Praise God. I, Stan, we've, we've accomplished something. I think we got, I think we've got it across to everybody. <laughs> Praise God. Well, lift your hands up to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you that I am saved. Heaven is my home and the blessing is in my life here in the earth. The blessing of the Lord makes me rich and adds no soil or toiling to it. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now you have an assignment. Go tell people in the world. And then bring them in here. Amen. 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 God bless you.